Hello everyone and welcome to Salem. I'm Ellen Green. Thanks for joining us today. We love having you spend this part of your Sunday morning with us. And please remember this service is available to watch and to share anytime on YouTube and on Facebook. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe to our channel. If you're on Facebook, you can like our page. Wherever you choose to watch, be sure to invite your friends to join us right here every Sunday at 10 o'clock a.m. That is Eastern Time. And I think it's only right that we talk for just a moment about some drama that happened here this last week. On Eastern Time. On Eastern Time. That's right. It was 11 <clears throat> p.m. on Eastern Time when someone, someone opened the door <clears throat> and our dog Pearl saw a rabbit and was gone. And we, we looked, we thought, oh, she'll come back in a moment. Nope. We looked for a couple of hours, up and down mm -hmm. every alley, up and down every street of the borough, flashlights. I'm surprised we didn't get arrested. Um, we put her bed out. We put a treat out for her. I didn't sleep all night. I kept waking up, going to the door, looking for the dog. And anyway, no sight. So again, at six o'clock in the morning when the sun came up, we started looking again. And then um, I put on Facebook, posted on Facebook, call the police. The people here told me to call the police about a lost dog. So, okay. I don't know. And people in, people in Texas where we came from are probably not going to understand this, but I have never seen a dog off a leash in the borough, have you? Never. Yeah, there's no dog wandering about, never. Um, and so, yeah, our dog was, was missing and everybody was concerned. I started getting all these pings on Facebook from people I'd never heard of before. Every, our, oh, I texted our friends, our friends were out looking. Um, people were showing up at our front door. There were. Wearing hats that said dog mom and Stuff like that. Asking about Pearl. I don't know how they knew where we lived. I don't either. Anyway, big deal here in Doylestown. And so finally I got a message, a private message on Facebook that said, I don't have your dog, but I know I, the guy that has it lives at this address. So it was about three blocks away. So we walk up, we drive over there. We don't know where he lives. So we drive over there and knock. Anyway, big bull mastiff comes to the door like a horse dog huge. And the guy says, Oh, I let my dog. This dog's name is by the way, Jethro. Let Jethro out at 1 AM. A lot of dog letting out in the middle of the night here. And Pearl, this dog followed Jethro back in. I thought, of course Pearl did. She wasn't going to sleep outside. She was hungry. So I would. she spent the night with Jethro and John, the man, and um, he fed her breakfast. She was all cheery. I was exhausted. We were exhausted. Yeah. Oh, and the- <laughs> I'm still exhausted. The best part is this. The best part is this. So I get home. I'm letting everybody know. Stop looking. We found Pearl. Um, oh, our friends drove up when we walked out of that house with Pearl. They were crying. They were, they were taking pictures. They were clapping. <laughs> I was like thinking of ways to hurt the dog. No, not really. Not really. <clears throat> kind of. Anyway, um, and so, and so, oh, I got home. All of a sudden, the police call, and I forgot to tell the police we found the dog. And so, the police call, and it, he says, uh, ma'am, this is Officer Brown, and I'm just wanting to know if you found your dog because, you know, I wanted to know whether our officers needed to continue looking or not. Continue looking? Your officers are looking for my dog? This is it, Doylestown. It, it's a tough beat here, I told, in, here in the city. I told David that I didn't think the officers in where we were from in Texas would be following up had I called and said, I just stabbed my husband and he's bleeding out. It didn't happen last time. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, so found the dog. Everybody's happy. And, um, the dogs are different. Doylestown is a, is a dog-loving community. I can tell you that. Okay, so that's that little story, and I, at some point we got to start the service. There, there, there's a godly lesson in this somewhere, <laughs> and we'll find it. I'm sure you will, but I'm going to go over here and...
Get ready. We are, we are thankful for all of those who may be watching today who uh, helped in uh, tracking Pearl down, including the excellent police department here in Dolestown. Thank you. So hi again. <laughs> I'm David Green. Um, I want to let you know if you have a joy or a concern today to please be sure and share that with everyone in the comments. Uh, you can do that either on YouTube or on Facebook, or you can just say hello to each other, check in, see what the weather's like in your neck of the woods. I've heard, where have we heard that? Oh, if you're new to Salem, I want you to, I want to welcome you especially and tell you a little bit about us. We are located in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, a wonderful place, and but we're also an online community, both right here and for people from all over. If you happen to live in Doylestown or nearby, let me let you know, we would love to have you join us in person. Our service is at 10 a.m. every Sunday. Now, our cause at Salem is loving and serving our neighbors just as God loves us. We are progressive, we're positive, and we're committed to the belief that everyone belongs and that God's love is absolutely unlimited. Now, that means no matter your age, your race, your gender, your sexual orientation or gender identity, your ethnicity or nationality, Whatever your faith background happens to be, we love you and we welcome you exactly the way you are. So here is what is coming up in our time together today. Chris White is reading a scripture passage for us from the Gospel of John. We will enjoy special music by John Beecher, a wonderful Easter song. We're still in the season of Easter in the Christian church. I'm speaking about categories, and then we'll spend time together in meditation and in prayer. I'm really grateful we're gathered together this morning, so let's get started with an opening prayer. Strong and loving God, thank you for this chance to gather together. Today we bring all of who we are, knowing that we are accepted and loved just as we are. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Salem. This morning's reading is John 21, verses 9 through 17. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them, and though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Peter, Simon son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I do. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is a beautiful song by Peter Mayer that, um, that David uh, suggested I, I look, look into and it is just just an awesome awesome song for today my favorite holiday it's called Easter Rising
God has risen All the earth's an alleluia All of heaven's an old melody Dancing free of every prison God is risen Shout the blood and the bone and the silent snow Fields of forest raise their hands And to the breaking Today, Chris read a passage from John that feels mysterious, and at the same time, it sounds kind of commonplace. It's sort of like the stuff of legend. It's mysterious because it happened after Jesus had already appeared to his disciples following his death a couple of times in a resurrected form. He'd come, out, he'd come to the place where they were hiding out together in Jerusalem, and he'd shown Thomas, doubting Thomas, as he's called, his wounds from being crucified. Now, since none of us were there, no one knows exactly what it even means to say that Jesus was in a resurrected form. What did that look like? On the one hand, it seems he could appear and disappear suddenly, sort of like a ghost. On the other hand, he could show someone his wounds and be touched. So he had a real physical presence of some kind, according to the Gospels. 
And as our story goes today, he could make a campfire and grill fish and eat it. And that's what makes the story feel so commonplace. That scene of fishermen gathering for breakfast on the shore of the big lake, sitting around a fire together, that kind of thing happened every single day. The only unusual thing about it was the one who had prepared the meal, Jesus. He had been their friend, their teacher, and they'd seen him do some remarkable things. Now, they did not understand everything he'd ever said and done while they traveled around the countryside with him for roughly three years. And now in this scene, it's safe to say it went way beyond their experience to be sitting around having breakfast with him after he had died. That would be like attending someone's funeral at the cemetery and then meeting them for brunch a few days later. That would be a little unusual. You might begin questioning your own sanity, but look, there he is. So there was no playbook for this, no precedent. Even after they'd seen him back in Jerusalem after his death, they still really had no idea what that meant or what they were to do next. They just knew it was very, very strange, and they probably needed time to process things. I know I would. So they went back to the only life they knew before they ever had met Jesus. They went back home and right back to fishing. If nothing else, they just needed to sort things out. But then Jesus shows up again at the lake shore, and John later tells us this would in fact turn out to be the last time that any of them saw Jesus up close and personal. So Jesus asks their leader, Simon Peter, a question. It was very simple. He says, do you love me? And three times he asks this same question. And every time Peter says, yes, of course, you know I love you. I do. And Jesus says, well then, feed my lambs, tend and feed my sheep. That's it. That's all Jesus says. And from this experience, the disciples thought they knew what that meant. Whenever Jesus had talked previously about a good shepherd, it seemed pretty clear he was referring to himself. And whenever he had talked about sheep, it seemed pretty clear Jesus was referring to everyone else. Now, some people hear this story and they interpret it to mean that, well, here was Jesus passing the torch of leadership over to Peter because Jesus was not going to stay around much longer, and at least in a way they could see him and clear him, see and hear him quite so clearly. So somebody had to carry on as head of this group, and that somebody was Peter. And maybe that is all this story is about. That at least that's how I learned it in Sunday school. But now I don't think that's all there is to it. We should pay attention to one thing, what Jesus was actually saying. If Jesus was merely passing the torch, wouldn't it be more specific? Wouldn't there be some plan of action he would give them? This would be a great moment to roll out a chalkboard like a football coach does at halftime and say, well, first, Peter, you're going to get the ball, move left, John's going to go deep, but you hand it off to Thomas and so on. But no, no nothing like that. And there were no instructions either given about reach out to and convert these people, but not those people. Or even for that matter, there was no command at all to go forth and start up a whole new religion. There was no creed or confession of faith to memorize or to recite, no checklist of acceptable or unacceptable beliefs or practices to follow. There were no hoops to jump through before you were welcomed in. Nothing at all about which hymns you were supposed to sing in church or how to organize a bake sale or balance the budget. It was simply, if you love me, tend and feed my sheep. That's it. Any way you look at it, that is a pretty broad call to action. The problem was the disciples were only human and humans have this tendency, it seems, just seems to be a deep-seated need we have, to categorize people. Now you could just say you're getting yourself organized, but so often getting organized means deciding who's in and who's out. So the broadest way to categorize is to say there are people like us and people who are obviously not like us. That, that can be based on physical appearances or geography or language or economics 
or politics or gender or maybe age. For some reason that no one's really ever been able to figure out, we humans just feel more comfortable and safe if we can look at another person across the room or see someone on TV who lives on another continent and say to ourselves, oh yeah, I know what they're like. Or at the very least, I know they're not like me or they're not like us. They're not part of my tribe. And that tendency to categorize people is absolutely one of the most powerful things going on whenever it comes to religion. In fact, it may be the most powerful thing about organized religion. It always has been that way. To define your religion by pointing out how it is different from somebody else's religion. To define people by their beliefs. You know, I get that all the time. People ask me, well, what does your church believe? Because they want to know how we differ from other churches. And, and if I said, it doesn't matter what our church believes, that would strike most people as really absurd. You've got to believe in something, right? And it most definitely was that way for Peter and the disciples. It was only natural for them to take the message of Jesus, all that he had taught and all that he did and the, the wonderful mystery and the power of love that was greater than even death itself, it was natural for them to take that and say, now this is all true, but it's only true for a certain type of people, for people who look like us, talk like us, who come from the same part of the world as us, and most importantly, who have the same religious beliefs as us. And at least to start, that's exactly what they did after they left their fishing careers behind. They returned to Jerusalem and they tried to spread their understanding of Jesus with varying degrees of success, but also with, not without getting into a lot of trouble. Thing is, they restricted their message only to people who fit into one certain category, Jewish people. It was beyond their imagining, apparently, that when Jesus told Peter to tend and feed my sheep, that Jesus could be referring to sheep who were not Jewish. Now, Peter eventually did come around to understanding that a sheep could mean anyone and everyone, whether or not you were Jewish, but that was much later. We read about that in the book of Acts. And the funny thing is, or the, maybe the really sad thing, is that even after the earliest Christians began accepting non-Jews into their movement, so much so that the non-Jews quickly outnumbered the folks with a Jewish background, that that old human need to categorize reared its head again. Now, we're often taught, or we just assume, that Christianity in the early days was one big happy family that grew and grew in a natural arc through the power of the Holy Spirit and became a dominant religion because it was the one true religion. But let's get real. If you've never heard it before, hear it from me. It was not one big happy family. Far from it. It's much more accurate to say that Christianity didn't grow and expand, but a, that a whole slew of various types of Christianities, plural, competed with each other. They wanted to claim the title of the one true faith. So in the first few hundred years after that breakfast cookout on the lakeshore, people who claimed to love Jesus, just like Peter did, fought with each other tooth and nail about who Jesus was and what he really meant. They disagreed on so many things that you and I think or might think are silly and inconsequential, but they believed were essential. Why? Because people might love Jesus but they also love to categorize, to insist it's only if you believe X, Y, and Z. It's only if you say this creed or this confession of faith out loud, and it's only if you sing this hymn and not that one, and it's only if you look just like us, think just like us, dress just like us, and dance the hokey pokey just like us that you can ever be one of us. And as time went on, those categories of who could be a sheep and who could not, fractured and grew more numerous. Until today, there are an estimated 45,000 distinct Christian groups or denominations, and that's, that's probably a low number. It's silly. Somewhere between Jesus giving Peter a very straightforward command, if you love me, tend and feed my sheep, 
And today, I wonder how well we're really doing that. We're still a lot more interested, apparently, in creating categories. And the one thing categories do best is to exclude people. So that means categories go against everything Jesus represents. When is every word, when is every action, when he proved that love is more powerful than anything, all of that points to one thing only, that God is not interested in categorizing anyone, but created us for the purpose of welcoming and loving everyone. That to love Jesus means you simply take care of each other, that you tend and feed my sheep, that you don't worry about who is us and who is them, as if we're in some kind of a contest over who gets to be right. And me being right means that you're wrong, so I win, apparently. And I just can't imagine Jesus ever endorsing that kind of thinking. To love Jesus doesn't mean that we're one thing over here and another thing over there. It means that we are one thing. We're all of us, all of humanity, all of God's creation. We are all sheep. It's simply not our prerogative to ever claim that God only loves and accepts you if you say the right set of words or you hold a precise set of beliefs. How presumptuous and absurd that is for any of us to place categories on what God refuses to categorize. But how wonderful and liberating it is for us to serve our neighbor, to care for our neighbor, to feed our neighbor, to tend to our neighbor, to love our neighbor, who are also known as sheep. And to realize that to do that is exactly what it means to love Jesus. Amen. Every time we gather, we invite you to join us in all we do together at Salem. Our reason for being as a church is to love and serve others by building a community where everyone truly belongs. We welcome all people on a journey of loving our neighbor, wherever our neighborhood might be. So please do invite your friends to watch this live stream service with you and to join in on one of our online activities. Again, if you're on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. And if you are on Facebook, please like our page. You should also know that you can join Salem, and we would love to have you as a member in our cause. If you'd like to learn more about that, please send me an email at david at salemstrong.org. But you can join us anytime by going to salemstrong.org backslash join and submit the new member form. Also, we invite you to please make a donation today at salemstrong.org to support the wonderful work we're doing together. Your gift of support strengthens our purpose of being and sharing God's light and God's love. And at our website, you can even become a sustaining giver. Thank you. Now, if you have not already, please take a look at any joys or concerns that folks have listed in the comments. Everyone matters. And be assured that whether they're made known or not, your needs are known by God who loves and cares for you always. Now, I have several joys. I've got one that you can participate in. Every month, Salem hosts a couple of book clubs, a fiction book club and a spirituality book club. The fiction book club meets every second Tuesday in person at Salem and on Zoom. And the book being discussed this month on May 10th at 7 p.m. is called The Good Wife of Bath. It is a great book, but you don't need to have read the whole thing or even read it at all to join in on the discussion. This is a really fun group. The Spirituality Book Club is now meeting every fourth Thursday at 6.30 p.m. In May, we're still only meeting on Zoom, but, and this is very exciting, in June, this group will resume meeting in person at the wonderful Doylestown Bookshop. So that will be a change from our usual day of the month and location. Anyway, this month, again, on Zoom only, we're meeting to discuss a book called Recipes for a Sacred Life. It's a series of stories about finding your purpose in life and how that is a spiritual pursuit and how things like family traditions and recipes handed down from generation to generation made that happen in the author's life. Again, to join in 
It is not a requirement to have already read the book. Just join us for the fun discussion. And that'll be Thursday, May 19th at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The Zoom links for both of these gatherings is on our website at salemstrong.org. Both of these book clubs are a fun way to get to know each other, especially if you're new to Salem. And they're truly great books you will enjoy. The books are selected by a panel of experts who know what's best for you. <laughs> Not really. The participants decide what to read and discuss because they are the experts and they're actually reading the darn books. Another big joy is that Salem recently learned that we are the recipient of a special grant from the state of Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I mean, to help bolster security at our historic building. Those funds are going to go toward repairing and replacing some old doors and windows. So that'll be one of the many upgrade and improvement projects we are pursuing. And you may not know this, but Salem is a very old, beautiful structure, our building is, where there are many opportunities to help us in a hands-on way with odd jobs, repairs, and projects to make sure that our facility keeps on being the place where our shared ministry flows from. And you may not know this, but we rely primarily on member volunteers to get all that work done. Our building's 125 years old, so it's a constant work in progress to keep things ship shape. I keep a big tool bag right in my office. So if you're handy with anything like painting or carpentry or electrical work or plumbing or landscaping, if you know how to swing a hammer without knocking yourself in the head, please reach out to us at contact at salemstrong.org. And we'll put you right in touch with our trustees who manage our buildings and grounds. We really need your help. So please help. One more joy is that next week is Mother's Day. I know. <laughs> Have you bought that special mother in your life a bunch of flowers yet? I haven't. I am such a slacker. But anyway, I still have a, next Sunday during both our in-person and streaming service, We'll be celebrating Mother's Day with a special video tribute. We've done this the past couple of years, and it's been a big hit. And if you want to include a photo of the special mom in your life, please mail, email that to me today at david at salemstrong.org. Unless, of course, you've already provided a photo before for previous years. I'll just use that one again. Again, I need that photo today, along with your mom's name and your name. And last but not least, a big joy is the return of our annual Youth Arts Fest. This is held on the grounds of Freeman Hall, which is located right across Court Street from our church building. It is Saturday, May 14th, 12 noon to 3 p.m., and it brings together teenage artists of all kinds displaying their work and live music performed by youth. They're fab fantastic. And here's something very important. The Youth Arts Fest is a community event. It's not just a Salem thing. So please spread the word about this with your friends on Facebook and so forth. Now, as we have for the past many weeks, we are continuing to remember the people of Ukraine in our prayers for a peaceful solution to that conflict, to acknowledge the loss of life and the grief and the displacement of so many millions of people from their homes. And it just so happens our denomination, the United Church of Christ, has a way that you can make a direct contribution to help those refugees have food, shelter, and medical care and a link to donate to that effort is also at our website at salemstrong.org. Now, I'd like to invite you into a moment of quiet meditation and prayer. So let's become centered by focusing in silence, simply on this present moment of being connected to God and connected to each other. Now please join me in prayer, and as we conclude our prayer, you're invited to join in as we speak the Lord's Prayer together. The words for the Lord's Prayer will appear right on your screen. Strong and loving God, we gather today thankful we can come together in prayer. You know our needs even before we speak them, and you know those spoken only in silence. So bring your healing, your wholeness, and your peace into every life touched by illness or injury. Bring your presence and your hope into every life that's lonely, afraid, or in mourning. 
Let all who need to know connection and belonging reclaim a sense of joy and know your acceptance and love that has no limits. And may we, God, be the instruments of that love as a church and as individuals. Let our lives be overflowing with the goodness and grace of living in your truth and your light. May we always seek to serve others and share your love. May that be our cause. And with your strength and persistence, may we always be confident that you are with us, that in your love there are no categories, that all are welcomed and embraced in one family of hope, peace, justice, and grace. For the gift of this life and this calling, we thank you, and we pray in the name of Jesus, as he taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you're not already a Salem member, you really ought to be. And so please accept our invitation to join our beloved community and our cause of serving and loving our neighbor. Salem's a church where everyone belongs, and God's love is unlimited. So wherever you have been on life's journey, you are welcome here. Join us online by submitting the form at salemstrong.org backslash join. And if you would like to learn more about membership at Salem, just send me an email at david at salemstrong.org. Thank you for your presence today. And remember that you are special, loved, and accepted by God and by us exactly the way you are and that you always belong. So we'll see you right here next Sunday. And until then, be well and safe and whole. And may God bless you and keep you today and every day.